Good afternoon, everybody. It is just after two o'clock. I hope all of you are having a fantastic Thursday and have all been doing well since our uh, last webinar covering this subject matter uh, a little over a month ago. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, again, like I said before, and I'll say it again, I know that you are overwhelmed and cover up with webinar, Zoom, go to whatever you want to call it meetings and we are honored that you have chosen to spend the next hour hour and a half with us as we go over the new market realities may update i am thrilled to have somebody who i don't think needs an introduction uh, our fearless leader joining me on today's webinar and i think she will be joining us momentarily via webinar there she is hello jenny how are you hey everybody good afternoon we Oh, I need to maybe unmute you or you need to unmute yourself. Let me uh, see. I, I am live. Hopefully you can hear me. I have a green microphone. No. Okay. I'll dial in, but you keep going. <laughs> hello, hello. Nothing. I see you as talking, but I can't hear you. Maybe okay, others I'll can. I'll dial in. All right, Blair says we hear her, everybody hears her but me. This is going to make things interesting. I'm going to switch up here. Hold on one second. Jenny, can you hear me? Say something and see if I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yay, all right, there we go. Must have been something technical on my side. I apologize. I'm hoping everybody can hear both of us now. Yes, excellent. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Luke. Appreciate it, everybody. Well, again, welcome, and uh, we're thrilled to have you here. I know we got a bunch of great information that we're looking forward to sharing with you. And like I said, I'm thrilled to have Jenny on the call with me today because it's really kind of intimidating just to kind of be the only person on the screen here and looking out into the World Wide Web. And at least I have Jenny to look at now, so that's comforting to know. So anyway, I thought we would kick things off with a little differently than we did the last time around and start off with a little poll. Uh, just to kind of get a sense of maybe where everybody is uh, currently in their real estate business, in their mindset, and just everything else. So I'm going to try and kick this poll off here, and you should hopefully see it show up on your screen. Um, and the poll says, uh, can everybody see the poll? No? Okay, hold on. Let me share. Let me share. Let me try and share. Let's see. How about now? I think you can see it now. All right. So the first question is, my real estate business is fantastic. Haven't missed a beat. A little slower than usual, but I'm not complaining. I'm busting my butt and doing everything I can. Like Atlanta traffic pre-COVID at a standstill, or I'm in bunker mode until the whole thing blows over. So let's see, we got the results coming in. Appreciate those who are participating. Uh, so far, we've got 23% uh, or so saying fantastic. I haven't missed a beat. About 40% saying a little slower than usual, but I'm not complaining. About 20% saying they're trying to get after it and doing everything they can. And about 25% saying like Atlanta traffic pre-COVID at a standstill. So. Looks like we got things kind of a, a mixed across the board and about half of you have voted. So we appreciate that. That uh, uh, is great to hear and love that uh, the people that are doing fantastic and haven't missed a beat, good for you guys. And just appreciate everybody in general working as hard as they can. So, all right, next question. Let's see. 
is I am blank about the rest of 2020. Uh, first, first one, bullish, going to make it my own destiny. Cautiously optimistic, hoping for the best. Neutral, got to wait and see. Somewhat pessimistic, I can only control so much. Or the last one, doom and gloom, game over. All right, we got bullish. Dave Wagner's bullish. I love it, Dave. Uh, let's see. Joan, hoping for the best. Raquel, cautiously optimistic. So basically, at the results I'm looking at here, about a third of you are bullish, and then about 60% are cautiously optimistic, and then 8% uh, are neutral, got to wait and see. So um, good. I like it. Very, very good. Okay, one more question, and then we will jump into the actual webinar here. The final question. Which of the below best describes your current state of mind? Very positive, life is full of rainbows and unicorns. Pretty positive, I'm making the best of things. Some days are good, some days not so good. For the most part, I'm still pretty concerned about things. And then the last one, life just stinks. All right, I'm seeing a lot of pretty positives, pretty positive, Brooke Dixon, pretty positive, Mary Mack, uh, Mary Ellen Mackey, pretty positive. Dave Wagner's positive. I like the mindset, Dave. Player versus a victim, right? Uh, let's see what else we got here. So about 16% are very positive. 63% pretty positive, making the best of things. 19, 20%, some days are good, some days not so good. And the reality is, guys, that, um, you know, just like we're kind of across the board here with these results, the same is going to be true with uh, other agents in our offices, our clients that we're working with. And I think that's just going to be something that we have to manage um, and we'll be dealing with for the many weeks and probably months to come. So thank you for uh, participating in those uh, polls. Greatly appreciate it. Um, a lot of you have already been using the chat, uh, so you know where that is. But as we go through the webinar and you have questions or anything like that, I will do my best along with Jenny to monitor uh, those and answer them just as quickly as we can. Um, and we are just going to jump right into this. Jenny, anything that you'd like to share with the group before we dive in? No, I, I'm excited to dive in. This is going to be great stuff and uh, good poll results. Love the mindset. Awesome. Okay. Let me get the uh, presentation pulled up here and out of the preview mode. For everybody. Okay, so what we're going to cover today is uh, go over some market trends, both pre and post pandemic. We won't dive as deep into them uh, like we did the first time around, but we will cover some highlights uh, and then touch on kind of where we are now and where we're going. We're also going to uh, touch on kind of what's going on in the economy and we think that's going to bounce back. Talk about some trends that have developed just as a result of all the craziness that we've been going through. And just then again, close out with some uh, suggestions on things that you can do as we continue moving forward. So here we go. Um, what I've done is uh, we've added Forsyth uh, this month to the numbers. Uh, several of you reached out and uh, said, hey, what about Forsyth? And uh, my apologies, we've got it in there now. But the first thing that we're looking at is a comparison of where we did the first quarter of 2020 versus what's been happening over the last 30 days. And the last 30 days uh, basically are from April 10th through May 10th when I pulled these numbers. So this is kind of what's been happening. And what you're seeing, the things I really want to point out are the focusing on the price reductions. And you'll notice that in the first quarter, as I talked about uh, last month, we were running at about a, a little over a third of the market was overpriced. Um, when it came to closings and everything else. And I think that was just because we had sellers that were bullish, uh, really trying to push the upper end on pricing. But interestingly, if you look to the far right column, look what's happened in the number of closings over the last 30 days in terms of the price reductions. It's been reduced to about a quarter of the market. So that kind of tells me one of two things. Uh, one, that the 
inventory that's been standing and out there for a while that's probably still overpriced. Um, probably buyers have seen it and they've passed and moved on. And those sellers that have gotten a little more realistic in alignment with the market, those are the properties that are selling. And so I think that's a pretty interesting trend. It just goes to show you how critical uh, pricing is, especially in the current market dynamics. And it's across the board. It's not really subject to one county. You'll notice that it's pretty much anywhere from a low of 24.1% in Cobb up to 27.3% in Fulton, but still a significant drop over the last 30 days in the number of homes that have had to do a price reduction. This is the new slide this month, just kind of trying to give you guys an idea of what's been going on with our pricing and sales. Uh, we keep hearing a lot about how there's such a reduction in the number of inventory coming on the market, a number of the reduction in the number of pendings and everything else. And yes, that is our reality, but this is a bright spot and something certainly to share, I think, with sellers. And it, it's focusing on median sales price, not the average, because a lot of times the median is a better statistic to use when you're trying to look at uh, kind of year over year or month over month gains or you know where prices are changing. So the first column here, you have what the April 2020 median was compared to the March, and then what that month over month change was. And then again, just what it was back a year ago in April. So again, for all of our counties, um, there have seen uh, both month over month changes in what the average sale price was along with uh, comparing from last year to this year. Some pretty significant gains uh, with the year over year with the cab leading the way at 13.6%, uh, 335 being the average median versus 295 a year ago. But again, positive information to share with your sellers as you're out in the marketplace. Uh, let's see, just kind of flipping back here to the questions. Um, all right. Uh, new construction figures are not part of your charts. That is correct. Uh, this is just resale, uh, single family detached residential only. So that's what we're looking at today is detached numbers that um, does uh, it for uh, resale. So, all right. Uh, next uh, slide is uh, this that we uh, got from Metro Study. And basically what it's showing is April sales show that closing prices continue to rise. And what you're seeing before you is just kind of, um, you know, a snapshot of where we were in the uh, 1980 and before from the 90s to 2000, 2000 to 2010, and then 2010 later. And then, so again, we continue to see those prices rise, which again is positive for sellers. So despite the fact that the activity is a little bit lower than it was prior to the COVID, situation uh, we are still seeing prices hold which again is something we expected to see and continue we'll expect to continue to see as we as we move forward uh, i'm not going to spend a lot of time in these slides they're really there just for you to take a look at after uh today's webinar but i did want to just kind of run through an example of what it is showing you basically the top table is the same table that we saw uh last month and then what I did is I broke it down and created a table for the last 30 days. So again, you can kind of see the trends and what's been happening in the various price points for the different counties. Um, and so again, this is for your reference, but you will see two things or a couple things again I wanna show and point out is we have been seeing across all the counties a significant decline in the total days on market especially for non-reduction homes or those homes that didn't require a price reduction in order to get an offer. And it is across the board, across each county. And I, I know that that's probably a little bit of a function of the hold status in homes that were probably listed and then went into a hold status and came back on. Uh, but I still think too, that that's some interesting trends that we have seen over the last 30 days. Uh, not only is it having an impact on the month's supply, in most cases, uh, which you can see here for Cherokee, but it certainly is having a big impact on the total days on market. And again, so for each county, you're gonna have two slides. The first will be the one I just showed, and then the next is gonna show you a comparison of the month supply this year in April versus last year in April. So for the under 500K in Cherokee, it ticked up a little bit to 2.3 versus 2.1, but still absolutely a seller's market in Cherokee County for homes priced under 500. And then also to look, look at uh, the two all columns over, the total days on market for all price points, I mean, not for all price points, for regardless of whether it was a price reduction or not, 
44 days in 2020 compared to 56. And that is a trend that has reversed itself that we're gonna call, cover in a moment. But just quickly looking at Cobb County, again, you're gonna see the same trends happening. 11.2 uh, days on the market. Yes, that's correct. 11.2 days for homes under 500,000 in the last 30 days in Cobb County. And you can see the other numbers here. You also have out to the far right hand side, there's even a reduction in the total number of days on market for those homes that had to do a price reduction in order to attract an offer. So again, just a comparison of the top table to the lower table for all the various counties. Again, taking a look at what happened, uh, month supply and total days on market. Uh, for the different price points in Cobb, running at 1.8 months. Again, definite seller's market, pretty much a balanced market in Cobb County in 2020 with a 5.3 month supply. And not any different from many of our counties, really in the million plus, we're seeing it more of a buyer's market with uh, you know, 10.8 month supply here. Again, just again, showing you for DeKalb County. Look at that, y'all, 11.1 total days on market for homes between, between 500 and a million. And again, these trends, they, they transcend across every single county in our metro area. Uh, quick take a look, look at this y'all, 6.6 .6 months supply of million plus homes in DeKalb County in 2020, balanced market for that property type uh, for DeKalb County, which is great for those of you that work in that marketplace. Taking a quick look at Fulton County, again, the trends continue, 19.4 days, total days on market the last 30 days compared to 30 days. Uh, in the first quarter. So all this to say that there is great buyer demand, in my opinion, out in the marketplace. Uh, and the market is definitely showing us that with all of these numbers that I'm sharing with you. Uh, again, throwing Forsyth up there. We did not review this last month, but you see what's going on in Forsyth. 21 days, which has typically kind of been the norm for all of Atlanta for the non-reduction. So that's right in line with what we've been seeing. Uh, and they didn't sell a house. Well, there's one home sold uh, and uh, you can see kind of what the thing was there. And it actually sold. It was probably a quiet listing or a coming soon because it wasn't on the market for any days. So that is not a misprint or a mistype. It is correct. And then again, you see the month supply and total days on market summary for April for Forsyth. Again, a strong seller's market for the under 500, a balanced market maybe trending towards a seller's market for the 500 to a million and you see what the million and above was. So all that to say, kind of some conversation points that you might want to take away from those slides is a significant downward trend in price reductions from the first quarter to the last 30 days. We've gone from about a third of the market being overpriced to just about a quarter of the market, which is pretty significant. It's about a nine to 10% reduction or, or total, uh, you know, going from 35 to about 25. Uh, the trend continues in a reduction of month supply across most of our price points. There might be a small exception here and there, but for the most part, that is a general rule of thumb. We saw a shift in the trend on the total days on market reverse from increasing from 2020 or from 2019 to 2020 to now decreasing. Again, I think that hold status probably had a little bit of an impact on that. And you may have remembered me saying last month that I'm not going to pay a whole lot of attention to total days on market for a while, but I did think that that was pretty interesting and significant. Plus two in the slides that Jenny's going to go over in a moment, you're going to see there really haven't been many people to take advantage of that hold status. So I don't imagine it's having huge, huge impact on the market. And the number of withdrawals too has been declining significantly. But overall, a big function of reduced amount of overall inventory um, is, you know, what's leading to some of these interesting trends. So. Speaking of the current inventory, Jenny, I'm going to let you take it away from here. Sure, absolutely. Um, so current inventory by county in May, as you'll see here, uh, obviously we would expect it to be reduced in 2020. So that's the negatives that you're seeing. Uh, but I'm actually surprised that it was not to a greater extent. And I think that bodes well for recovery. In fact, I think that we may even have a compressed um sprint if you will um because there's still some deadlines and people want to make the summer move and so i think there's going to be a lot of activity and i bet you're already starting to feel some of that happening um so as you'll notice that compares uh to inventory a year ago and the number of price reductions todd basically talked about already that that's around a third previously 
And then withdrawn in the last 30 versus 60 days, you can tell there's not much of a difference between those numbers uh, in comparison and then those on hold for the last 30 days. Again, not significant in, uh, in its impact. This was very interesting and you may or may not have seen it, but in USA Today, it demonstrates that Atlanta is actually seeing an increase in listings, which we've talked about either in our videos or other communications that we've shared with you all already. And um, that's that bodes well. The other thing um, that I wanna add here is yesterday I heard Lawrence Yoon, who is the head economist for NAR, and he basically said that the Midwest and the South, and he particularly also mentioned Atlanta, was recovering faster than most of the nation. So that's a great thing. And it is you know, very foundational to the things that we believe why it's such a great place to live. But it's nice to see that bear out in the actual numbers. And here, what you're gonna see is the a builder, Atlanta specific builder survey results. And the question was, you know, how do you see the pandemic impacting your inventory plans? for 2020 or your building plans. And basically most of the builders indicated if you add them together, it's about 80-ish uh, percent, a little more than 80, felt like their business would be slightly adjusted by either 80% or 60%. So what they plan to build will be 80% um, instead of the 100% or 60% in most cases. And I suspect that that's just due to the um, limitation of time and the limitation of supplies. So sorry about um, that. Didn't mean to skip ahead. I do think they'll recover quickly from that. And one thing too, uh, Jenny, that they were pointing out on uh, when they shared this with us the other day is just how this is going to continue to put downward pressure on the inventory situation because. Uh, builders, you know, we the builders have been having such a hard time keeping up with the demand to begin with, but because of this happening, and you know, some of the reduction too was attributed to their ability to get the labor, um, you know, people working on the homes and so forth and so on, and just a natural uh, contraction of this what they had the ability to produce between now and the end of the year. But again, it's going to have a big impact on our inventory situation as we continue to move through this and into the uh, coming months and years, which is uh, what this is kind of showing. Yeah, it certainly indicates, I mean, that would explain why the adjustment from uh, what it was is shrinking the days on market because there's less inventory with new homes. So the inventory that was there is um, happily being gobbled up, which is a great thing. And here what you'll see is um, basically at the end of the first quarter, there's a little tick mark and then uh, about 25,000 uh, annual starts at the end of the first quarter. And they do expect uh, basically a small dip there and then returning basically by 2023. Uh, again, these are projections uh, and that was if it was down 10%. So later you'll see some other projections that are uh, kind of mirroring this. And Todd, I'd love your comment on this one, but basically, uh, the forecast is pretty interesting, and I like how they did a best case, middle of the road, worst case here. Yeah, so basically what this is showing, assuming the 80%, you know, um, of the people surveyed, you know, what they're planning in terms of the rest of 2020, this kind of like lays out what would happen, you know, so the best case is, you know, what we've talked about, and then you have the middle of the road, the worst case, and so forth and so on. And so we're really hoping that that orange line is, uh, I mean, the uh, green line is what we have happened, the best case, this lower level. And uh, what's interesting is, is um, the month supply you'll notice is a little bit higher than, than, than what the resale is. And a typical balanced market for new construction is around that uh, seven to eight month time period. And that's probably because that's about the length of time it takes to build a typical home. Uh, when you start getting up into the upper numbers is when you start, when the builders really start getting a little nervous. Uh, but I've already uh, been hearing about uh, builders getting a little more, making a few more concessions uh, than they were in the past. You know, for a long time now, they're really kind of taking advantage of the fact that there was an inventory 
shortage issue. And now I think what they're doing is, because um, I've talked with a lot of agents in the past and saying builders have just gotten back to the way it was back in the 2005, 2006, where you go and ask for an upgraded carpeting pad and they're not willing to do anything. Well, I think the reverse is gonna start to happen and there might be some opportunities for those of you working with buyers in the new construction segment to maybe get a little bit of an extra thrown in or a little bit of an upgrade. So again, something positive for the clients that we're working with right now. Perfect. Yeah, and here what you'll see is uh, Cherokee County. So the, we're gonna kind of walk through each county here, but basically a good rule of thumb, at least in the current market, is that properties that are under 500 generally are between 50 to 70% of the market. And you'll kind of notice that across all the counties. Obviously, it's a little different by county, but that's a, a good rule of thumb for our metro area. And then you can kind of see here, uh, Fulton County is 50-50. Actually, it's a little less than 50-50. So it's probably, um, you know, on the spectrum, the, the one that is most evenly balanced. And then you saw at the beginning, the one that was 70%, uh, which I believe was Cherokee. Yep. And the price is, you know, yep. varying somewhere between 25% to 33%, uh, depending on the county and the price point as well here. Yeah, that's an interesting trend we're going to have to watch is this is, again, the current inventory. So if you recall back, we just talked about 25% was roughly the uh, percent reductions of the closings. So we still have a lot of inventory out in that market right now that is overpriced and is not moving, has not been gobbled up by the buyers yet. And so I saw the question that came in asking about, you know, when is a good time to be having that conversation if you've been on the market for for two plus months um, in terms of a price reduction. I, I think the sooner you can get it, the better. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think that we're going to be controlled by things like holidays and graduations and things of that nature that we typically kind of see happen and kind of create triggers for us. And they say, well, let's wait till Memorial Day and then we'll go ahead and do the price reduction because nobody's going to be looking for houses. I think people are looking for houses, you know, all the time now and the holidays and graduations aren't the disruptor that they typically are uh, historically. So any any thoughts on that, Jenny? Yeah, I'll add one other thing that I learned yesterday, uh, again, from Lawrence Yoon, and they did a survey of buyers and sellers and basically said, what do you anticipate is going to be the impact on pricing? And uh, sellers uh, in true seller form indicated that uh, they 90% ex expected the pricing to hold true. And buyers of the buyers, they felt like 60% of the pricing would hold true. So uh, interesting sort of inequity there. We'll see how that plays out in the marketplace. Yep. Always the case, though, buyers and sellers being a little uh, not in aligned. <laughs> All right, so Very we're going to take a quick look, too, uh, with what's happening with the current pending inventory. So those homes that went under contract over the last uh, couple of days and what's been going on uh, with those properties. And we're gonna just take a quick look at the six core counties. So this is all of the counties, including Gwinnett, and giving you kind of a comparison. This is, uh, you've heard of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, this is kind of like the downright ugly, the things that we're all kind of dealing with and we've been living through. But there is a, a bright side to all of this that I'm gonna share with you in a moment. But uh, for the entire market, uh, for the past, uh, period of time of May 1st through May 10th, uh, we were down uh, from a pending inventory, or, you know, things that went under contract by about 63%. Uh, and if you compare that to the same time frame, May of this year to April of this year, we're down about 32% for the entire market. And then you see the adjustments or the, or the percentages down uh, by price point break, you know, the under five, the five to a million and the million plus. So again, not the greatest of slides to really focus on. So we're gonna move quickly off of that, but you need to know kind of what we've been living through. This is the one though that I think is really, really uh, more positive and a lot more interesting. And again, this is the uh, what has gone under contract in the six core counties in the last 30 days, broken down by uh, county. So again, kind of what we touched on before, the last 30 days, total days on market, and this is again across all price points, uh, regardless of whether or not there was a price reduction or not, we're running at about 41.5 days in Cherokee compared to 57.7 in the first quarter, so a big, big decline 
in the total days on market. And then again, I've showed the price reductions uh, irrespective of price point and just showing you kind of what the trend has been happening. The only county to really not see significant declines, but yet still a decline was DeKalb that moved from a 32.9% to 30%. So still a little bit less than a third of the market overpriced in DeKalb County. But for the rest of the counties, significant drops. Um, you know, look at uh, even Forsyth went from 68.7 days, total days on market to 41. Look at Cobb going from 49.2 to 30. I mean, that's a lot of days. That's three weeks almost right there, everybody. So again, a positive sign, just I think more indication of a limited inventory situation that I'm sure many of you are feeling right now. I was talking to one of our brokers uh, yesterday who had an agent who just put a property on the market and over the weekend had 20 offers come in. Now you wanna talk about dealing with multiple offers. Um, I don't know how they handled or juggled. They had to create a spreadsheet to manage all of these offers that were coming in. I heard of another situation where we had eight offers coming in on the same property. So again, the, the, the demand's out there and we do have still uh, an inventory uh, situation. So anything you'd like to add to that, Jenny, or anything that you've been hearing? Um, similar, certainly not to the level of 20. So my goodness, they're probably <laughs> still sorting through that. Uh, but I think, you know, in properties that are, are well positioned and well priced, that that is going to to make a difference but i also think that people are not going to overpay so really walking that fine balance there yeah for sure for sure uh and so again just some conversation points to be mindful of uh summarizing the last couple of slides we took a look through uh while inventory is still down compared to the same time period it has improved over the last 30 days uh, like we were talking about earlier, we're seeing that inventory and those listings start coming back onto the market. You've probably been having conversations with some of your sellers who have been in a holding pattern, a wait and see, or for whatever reason they might have, and they're starting to see that come on. Um, uh, interesting trend was, you know, a third of the active inventory uh, has experienced at least one price reduction. We kind of covered that. However, the sales about 25%. So still got a lot of inventory out there that probably needs to maybe still come down a little bit. Uh, and then there's been a significant dip in the total days on market. Again, maybe a small function of the hold status. I don't think all that much. I think it's just a matter of when a good house comes on the market and it's priced correctly, it's gonna go. So um, we are going to now shift into what's next and what we think is gonna be on the horizon for the, you know, next couple of months and probably through the rest of 2020 and we're going to cover things like when is the economy going to recover what's the unemployment picture looking like right now trends as a result of uh, covid and then finally finishing up with what should i be doing right now so jenny i'm going to let you take over and kind of share with us what's been going on in the economy and when we think it's going to fully recover sure well, I appreciate you giving me probably the most difficult question, uh, <laughs> the whole thing. So thanks for that. Um, but gosh, I think if we knew this for sure, wouldn't we be amazing? But I think we can sort of read the tea leaves, if you will, or look at some data to help us make those decisions. And what you'll see here is uh, that basically the GDP for 2020 was uh, the first quarter was projected to be down almost 5%. And in fact, it did turn out to be uh, very close to that number. And these four uh, financial institutions, obviously very reputable, uh, very solid and stable for many, many years, they have projected a second half recovery. And I think that's consistent with what I'm hearing across various uh, reporting mechanisms. And um, so, yes, certainly we had a dip in the second quarter, but the third and fourth quarter are gonna show so strong signs of recovery, not only for the financial institutions, but the overall economy, which is reflective of the GDP. And this is not our um, terrible artwork, thank goodness. Uh, this is sort of the projection that we're anticipating for the recovery. And in a little bit later, if you'll stay on this slide for a second, but in a little bit later, we're going to show you how this compares to uh, the Great Recession or, um, you know, when uh, there was the attack on the World Trade Center. So just so that you can kind of have that as a reference, 
But what we're seeing is a drastic drop, which we knew and have experienced. And what we're going to see is a fairly speedy recovery, not a V, but certainly uh, more speedy than probably most of the significant worldwide or national events in the past. So that bodes well. Yeah. And the uh, link there below, Jenny, is a link to an article that kind of talks about it being more of a check mark uh, by uh, Mike Del Preti and a, a great resource too if you don't follow him he's he's great in terms of and he covers atlanta and all of his analysis so it's a great great thing to check out which is why i included that link down there absolutely yeah he's he is another great resource from our partnership with uh leading real estate companies of the world um yes he stands alone but we have some great input from him and I would love your input on the science of things since you handed me the most difficult question of all. <laughs> there you go, happy to take it. So really kind of what it boils down to is, you know, in terms of a recovery, it's not, you know, there, there's more to it than just, you know, the economics of it. So you do have the business science, which is gonna kind of be, you know, how have the economies rebounded with similar uh, slowdowns uh, historically in the past, but you also have the health science uh, which you know we're all living through, seeing on the news and so forth and so on. Of when will the uh, COVID be under control, and will there be another you know flare up with the virus this fall? So those are all things that I think are in the back of people's minds or most people's minds as we kind of re-enter the marketplace and re-enter our offices. And then the third component you have to it is the people science. And then you know after businesses are fully up and operational. How long is it going to take American consumers to return to normal consumption patterns? For example, going to the movies, attending a sporting event, you know, flying, et cetera. So you have all of these dynamics who are kind of working together that are going to impact, I think, you know, what we see as we move forward into the next, you know, months and probably for the remainder of, of 2020. And I, I thought this was a, a really, really good quote. It says, although the uncertainty of the crisis means forecasts of economic activity, are more unclear than usual, we expect that most of the economic damage from the virus will be contained in the first half of the year. Uh, going forward, we should see a recovery starting in the second half of 2020, much like you were uh, mentioning earlier, Jenny, and that's coming from the chief economist at Freddie Mac. Uh, so I thought that was a great uh, little sound bite. And then another thing from CNBC, uh, evidence is mounting that home buyers may be coming back to the market after demand plummeted in the past month due to the coronavirus, and that was on CNBC. And something that's not in the slide that I just read this morning, um, uh, this was off of MSN, was talking about specifically, again, Georgia and how we're seeing a huge uptick in the percentage of um, uh, purchase mortgages, and it's double digits uh, for the last uh, couple of weeks or this week compared to last week. And I know I had uh, Rick on last month kind of talking about what's going on in the mortgage world, and we don't have him today or anybody uh, that can speak to that. But um, my sense is that that would be, uh, they've been feeling that too in terms of uh, at prosperity. But I thought that was another positive sign. They, uh, they mentioned other marketplaces that were in the Southeast. You know, another hot, hot market right now is uh, Texas and specifically Austin and Dallas and they came out of the shelter in place around the same time that we did here in Georgia. So again, just kind of going back and showing the uh, good buyer demand. Uh, speaking of demand and showings, this is just a graph showing what the impact of COVID has had to real estate showings in North America. And this is coming from showing time. And you can kind of see where we were at the beginning of the year and how we peaked out the first week of March and then it just fell off a cliff. But look what's been happening over the last uh, couple of weeks, specifically in April, that we just all lived through. We're basically back up to the number of showings that we were at at the beginning of the year on a moving seven-day average. So again, in, in, in on my opinion, a very positive sign. And probably, you know, many of you have been, you know, feeling that out in the marketplace. I've received a couple of emails from folks saying, I'd love to be on the webinar today, but I'm actually gonna be out showing property. So good for you. And uh, you know, it shows that the buyers are coming back. Um, you wanna take on this one, Jenny? Sure, uh, percentage of homeowner equity. So actually I was gonna share something that very much aligns with this as well. But basically if you add the, the largest slice there, 
and the second largest slice that basically is about 60% of homeowners have a significant amount of equity. It's actually about 60%. So 60% of homeowners have about 60% or more of equity. And the reason that this is important is the, the financial impact and the real estate crunch that we felt and lived through in 08 and 09 is very different than the dynamics of the market that are happening right now. And um, that will sh that is another reason that our economy will recover sooner and real estate will not have the level of impact that is before. And this slide just goes into more detail about 177,000 uh, is the average equity of mortgage homes. So uh, yeah. that's the thing. And while you're on this slide, I'll, I'll share two other things. Um, going back to something that I learned yesterday as well, the GDP details of 2020 for the first quarter um, indicated that people's income rose 2%. But what was more interesting is personal savings were up 152%. And uh, wow. point a little bit later, I'll talk specifically about the luxury market, uh, because right now that is uh, probably the most impacted. But I think that will be short lived as two things return. One is the, the greater availability of jumbo opportunities and just greater consumer confidence as a whole. But in short, the equity that homeowners have and combined with the personal savings uh, that have been in existence basically indicate that people could buy, no matter what their price point is, uh, whether first time home buyer or luxury, it just is a matter of them feeling comfortable. Yeah. And to your point, I mean, you know, different from the previous uh, recession or whatever uh, back in 08 and 09, people aren't going to walk away from $177,000 in cash, which is the way you kind of have to look at it. You know, they're not going to just say, I can't make my mortgage payment anymore and I'm just going to walk away from it. So this is why this slide is so powerful too, just kind of showing that it's really unlikely that we're going to see anything like that we saw uh, back in that time period. So, um, Job losses. You know, we've been hearing a lot about unemployment, unemployment numbers. The Department of Labor just came out with their uh, uh, numbers for uh, last month on Friday. But do you want to kind of walk us through some of these unemployment uh, things that we're going to take a look at? Absolutely. So, I'm, I mean, from a confidence standpoint, the, the headlines about that is, are unnerving. But going back to the financial component that we just talked about, that is more um, gaining, it, it adds confidence back to the equation. And I think the reason that you'll see why there was a peak in March 28th is because of the um, federal uh, sort of additional funds that undergirded uh, unemployment. And as that looks to expire uh, soon in the uh, end of June, a lot of people are going to come back and they, that additional um, benefit will expire. And not only that, but if you think about um, companies that are returning to work, they wanna be fully staffed and they wanna be highly operational. And so all of those things bode well. What you can see from this is that the bulk, whether you can read it or not, that red line is servers and bartenders. So they kind of broke this down by industry or specific roles within industries. And the majority is what you would expect, right? You guys are smart. Hotels, um, you know, surprisingly doctor's offices, but I think we know why, because that was not uh, mandatory. Temporary services, retails, and servers and bartenders have been the most affected, as we would expect. Yep. Uh, and, uh, you know, you notice too, you think childcare, well, why is that? But, you know, that you just heard that the, I, I saw yesterday on the TV that um, some, you know, 50% of the daycares are still not open across uh, uh, Georgia. And um, so a lot of those people are just waiting for, I think, there to be less stringent requirements for them to be open in terms of protecting the children and everything else with as we go through these different phases and so forth. But, uh, you know, a big thing here too is that while, I don't like to see anybody be without work. I think on this next slide, it's going to be really, really telling, and I'll let you, uh, you know, share what is here. But you know, it's only temporary, right? 
Yeah, I mean, the good thing that we see, good thing from a from a difficult situation, is that 85, more than 85% are employed, which is good news. And uh, of that, what you'll notice is that 90% of those that are unemployed expect that to be temporary. So think of it like a furlough to take advantage of the government um, subsidizing the uninsurance or, or unemployment insurance. So that's a plus. And then uh, as far as the group that is most affected, it is teenagers. And you think of that because, you know, um, more of like a, a temporary or an hourly kind of retail type of roles. So that yeah. uh, would indicate that's not really our buyer population, um, at least not yet. Yeah, at least not yet, I was gonna say. <laughs> All right, uh, let's see, next thing we have, um, this is, a, you alluded to it, so I'm gonna let you take it. Sure, so uh, you can see the yellow line is the Great Recession. And uh, obviously that was a very drawn out uh, recovery period, the ninth year there. And um, this is spe specifically talking about unemployment. When will the unemployment rate return to where it was before this whole thing started? So these are the comparative things. Uh, the Great Depression, it took about 12 years. Uh, and then the projections that we touched on earlier or Goldman and JP Morgan, and they're definitely more of a V-shape or a swoosh, if you will. Yep. All right, so gonna talk in, jump into kind of the people science, um, you know, that we alluded to before, how we have the business science, the health science, and the people science. And uh, these are things that, you know, kind of just is what's going on. And I thought this was really, really interesting. This is a, a quote directly from Google. And it says the data tells us people are looking for two things right now, help and comfort. If you're able to help them to navigate the current situation, tell them about that. Things like a caring human being with the resources to help millions, then act accordingly in the mutual interest of business and society. So that's big brother telling you what people are searching for and Googling right now is I need help with something, or I need to find something that's gonna kind of comfort me and help me get through all this craziness that's going on in the world right now. So how can you use that or parlay that to something that you can do tangibly in your business? Well, the first thing that you can do is make your, message, make your messages simple and effective. So however you're communicating your message to your sphere, your contacts, your clients, whomever, just make it simple and effective. The second thing is remain hyper current on all housing info. And, you know, by that, what's going on in Atlanta? What's going on in Fulton County? What's going on in North Fulton County? What's going on in Roswell High School? I mean, that's to the extent of how hyper-local you really need to be getting. But then you also want to be mixing some of that micro data with the macro data because the reality is, you know, most people's uh, sources of information are what they access uh, when they click on the remote on a nightly basis and they're seeing the evening news or they're turning it on to whatever news source they want to, to watch or uh, use online. So that's where they're getting a lot of their information. And as we all know, they love to push these headlines that you know inject fear or you know instability or uncertainty. So that's where you need to kind of be using a mix of those two things. And then the last thing is, and I gotta again give a shout out and a kudos to the three folks who participated in the virtual open house yesterday. It was fantastic. If you didn't have a chance to watch it, I know it's being recorded and the link will be sent out shortly. So thank you to Emily, to uh, uh, Rachel uh, Brockstein, to Butch, and to uh, Donna Gello for uh, jumping in and leading us through some of those things. It was great. But number four is use videos on social media and Zoom meetings and any other kind of meeting like we're using today because that is the new way, uh, something that we all have been adopting and getting more accustomed to over the last couple of weeks. So all things to keep in mind as you're planning the last half of 2020 in terms of what you want to do from a marketing standpoint and how you're going to finish out the year. So how can you help consumers make uh, easier decisions? Well, we all know that there's a left brain and a right brain, and all of us are each kind of have tendencies going to one or the other. But the left brain helps, you know, left brain is for those that are left brain, give them facts, be a realist, and solve their needs. And for those right brain individuals, visualization, storytelling, make the world better 
uh, be human and solve uh, for desire. You know, those are things that you can be doing when you're working with uh, those that are right brain. But uh, believe it or not, the science tells us that when we're in times like this, the right brain is what controls uh, in market times like this. Uh, it drives decisions, it drives loyalty and emotion sells. So even if you might be more left brain leaning or have those tendencies, you're gonna wanna turn your right brain on a little bit more because that's how people are making decisions right now. And we're gonna jump into just the importance um, what what this has caused in terms of just the overall importance of a sense of home and everything else. And right here, home has never been more important uh, than before. So Jenny, I'm gonna let you cover kind of what we're seeing here specifically in Atlanta with regards to who's shopping and what's been changing. Sure. Uh, so you'll see ranked here at the bottom, uh, the, the leading set of uh, purchasers right now are the tweeners. So 1975 to 1984, basically uh, 36 to 45 year olds, they are um, the leading contingent uh, in here in Atlanta. Uh, the second is mature Gen X. So those that are 46 to 55, and then young boomers, uh, maybe downsizing or um, just want something updated as the case may be, and then young Gen Y. So uh, think of them as first time home buyers, 26 to 35. And it was interesting that um, most people, uh, specifically in Atlanta, because the average uh, to turnaround time, if you will, is about 14 years. Obviously that varies, uh, but between seven and 14, but 14 being the utmost. So if you think about that, in a lot of cases for people's adult life, they are only selling once or twice. And obviously selling in the market that we have right now is very different than perhaps when they sold before. So um, turning on that right brain, yes, they should have the market data, but they also need your support. And having a nice blend of the two is uh, what's gonna make us most successful. Yeah, it was interesting too, when I was uh, um, you know, hearing some of this information the other day, specifically talking about the young boomers, um, you know, there's an interesting trend and we're going to kind of touch on it a little bit as we talk about some things that we're seeing in regards to what they're wanting in the homes these days. But a lot of these young boomers are taking in aging parents. And so you have households that have three generations in them in some cases. You've got the children, you've got the young boomers themselves, and then you've got the parents of the young boomers. So it's creating the need for having multiple master bedrooms or you know those kinds of things and a lot of things on the first floor uh, to help with these aging parents. So you have a lot of families coming together and I think uh, in light of everything that's been happening, we're gonna see a lot more of that, of the family unit kind of condensing and getting a little more closer together. So it'll be interesting to see how that you know evolves over the next you know many, many months and, and years to come. Um, I love this slide just because, and it kind of, it doesn't really fit with what we just talked about, but I didn't really know where to slide it in, so I just put it here. But it's a great graph, in my opinion, because it really talks about how, what the, what the impact of low interest rates does to the buying power of any consumer. And so if you look at it, you've got kind of like where interest rates are is the dotted line right now, and you can kind of move that to the left or the right according to kind of where they are in today's market but it just shows you and then it shows you kind of like the the you know if they have the um the, the down payment um what they have you know and what they can actually afford so as the interest rate goes up it significantly impacts um what they can afford uh in terms of a house so i thought it was just a great slide that you could put into your buyer packet or something like that uh when you're working with folks so um, talk a little bit about this next slide, Jenny, and um, you know what we're seeing specifically here in Atlanta in terms of a motivation to buy. Sure. Well, first, I'd love to acknowledge that is a really gorgeous kitchen. So um, <laughs> we should just take that in for a moment, and then we can talk about what's on the right. But basically, the top motivation to buy in Atlanta, it's location. And why? 
Um, one, I think lifestyle amenities, you know, schools, perhaps all of those components, if you will. Uh, but traffic has historically been a driver. It will be very, very interesting to see what, uh, if that shifts and to what degree. Uh, I think everyone wants to love where they live. And that's like the dumbest statement in the world. But as it translates to this, location is still king. Uh, home design, second and very, very close to leading. It's actually ahead of price, uh, which is fascinating. Um, but, and then you can see the rest, which are, you know, typical components that we would expect as far as top motivators. Great. Uh, next slide is kind of talking about, you know, uh, what what are the top home features that uh, they're currently looking for specific here to Atlanta? And again, all of these slides that we're going to be taking a look at moving forward are Atlanta based and focused. So um, top home feature, 95% say interior style uh, of the home is, is hugely uh, critical to them followed up closely by more function of space, which we're gonna to touch in a little bit more and give you some specific examples of how people are using actual space in the homes and how they want to be using them uh, moving forward. Better lifestyle, obviously big. Uh, the exterior style of the home is still significant as well. And then you see some of the other things. Affordability, interestingly, um, you know, only 77% said that affordability was something that was, um, you know, uh, important to them from a home feature standpoint. Larger home and larger uh, yard kind of bottoming out there, but still significant at 58 and 52%. Uh, I thought this was interesting uh, because, you know, we have been known as being a very traditional style marketplace Atlanta has for, for many, many years, um, both externally and internally or interior wise. But this is just kind of showing you that we have actually tip the scale uh, and more people are leaning towards and wanting more of a modern look feel uh, when you combine the somewhat modern and modern to the very traditional and somewhat traditional. And you know, by modern, it's not like over the top crazy lines and crazy architecture. It's more of like, you know, what you see in the interior. And a good example is the photo uh, to the bottom right where just clean lines and everything else. And I'm sure many of you, as you have been out uh, showing new construction and everything else have probably been seeing some of this stuff uh, that's been coming up out of the ground. So uh, I think a trend that we'll continue to see um, moving forward. And I'll just make a quick comment here. Um, I want to give a congratulations because a lot of you are on social media and you are getting this into the thought pattern of your clients or potential clients. And I love that. And what I've seen some of you do very successfully is which do you prefer, A or B? And then there's kind of a, a thing there and it creates a very helpful dialogue, uh, it, not only to understand the mindset of potential clients, but also to get them thinking about, hey, if you're gonna sell your house, which of these is more appealing to you? So um, great job, you all are, are doing fantastic things with uh, your social media. Couldn't agree with you more, Jenny, you're right on. Um, this is just kind of showing, you know, the home levels that are preferred and uh, the two-story home still is by far, uh, by almost 50%, the preferred uh, type of construction that home buyers are currently looking for in Atlanta. Uh, then also thought it was interesting that 30% uh, of the two-story would prefer the master to be on the first level <clears throat> and then you can see too that two masters one on each level uh 19 percent and i think that kind of speaks back to what we were talking about earlier with the the, the families all kind of coming together and having to have a place for uh the uh aging parents to 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 move in and not have to deal with stairs so um the next slide jenny i'll let you cover this one yeah, I'll be honest, this was a little bit of, of a surprise to me, uh, yeah. and it'll be also interesting to see how this might change or not, as the case may be, but the most popular home size between 25 and 3,500 square feet, uh, and, and if that is across all price points, that probably makes a lot more sense, 
Um, but I think it could differ based on, uh, you know, which of those sort of demographic groups may be purchasing and, of course, where those homes are located as well. Yeah, I think, too, is, you know, what I'm seeing, at least, is I, you know, I'm out and about driving around from a new construction standpoint. I think we're seeing, for the most part, more condensed living. The house is a little tighter, closer together, creating more of that sense of community and feel. And, you know, just really kind of getting more creative with how they're actually using the space uh, inside the homes to create some of these different uh, rooms that people are wanting from their homes. Um, this is definitely something that is uh, relatable, especially to what we've all been dealing with. And I think we're going to continue to see demand for this more and more as we continue to move forward. Uh, but the wellness industry is a 4.2 trillion, uh, with a T, not billion, trillion dollar business a year. And with everything that's been going on, two things that are really, really important to people right now are not only clean air, but also the access to clean drinking water. So I think that we are going to see a big, big shift and change with a lot of focus on the ability to create really, really clean air environments in homes. Uh, almost 70% that were polled said they would pay more for a clean air in their home. And, um, you know, again, so if you're talking with somebody who's in a resale and the HVAC units are getting ready to go out or thinking about changing them, I think there's going to be a huge, huge push to, you know, these things with these massive filters and the ability to recirculate the air and so forth and so on is going to be hugely important, along with the ability to have really, really clean filtered drinking water whether that's coming through the fridge whether it's coming through the the tap or anything like that so anything you want to add on uh as far as that goes jenny oh sounds good to me okay um another thing too is um you know we talked about it a little bit ago uh with everybody having to work from home lately for the most part i think it has brought on the new a new emphasis or revitalized this whole notion of you know, organization in the back office. Uh, in this picture, you can see here the back office. It doesn't have to be a separate room or a fancy space. This is just kind of like a, a nice uh, a, a piece of nice uh, wood or laminate or whatever put across in between a nice window with a view and probably like in a little nook or something like that in a kitchen. But 60% plus or minus said they'd pay an extra $10,000 to have a small office or large laundry room uh, in their home. And so I think, again, we're going to continue to see, especially maybe if you have people who are thinking about making some home renovations and they reach out to consult with you or get your ideas or suggestions, just something, again, to be mindful of and have awareness to that you might want to share with, you know, uh, people in your sphere and so forth and so on. Anything on as far as that goes, Jenny? Uh, no, I think that some people are already starting to repurpose, like if there's a, a bedroom on the main level, um, that even if there is an office and there's two people that live in that you know particular home, that one might be an office, and previously it might have, the second would have been a bedroom, and now it might be two offices. So it'll be interesting to see if that trend continues. Yep. And then the last thing here is just kind of a summary of some of the slides that we just went through, just uh, highlighting uh, some of those, again, talking points that you might want to pull out. Uh, the first one being home is more important today than it has been for the last 100 years um, or later. And again, I think just because a function of a couple of things, everybody's been cooped up in them for the most part for the last 45 to 60 days. Home gives a sense of security and safety and everything else. And people are just realizing that, you know, it's just not a place to pull in, leave the car, sleep in, and then you go off the next day. So I think that is something we're going to continue to see be important. I think it is going to impact uh, maybe uh, some of the properties people uh, look for. We talked about this a little, little last month, you know, maybe more of these self-sufficient homes or getting off the grid uh, in case something like this were to happen again is something that people might be looking at or just self-sufficiency of the home. but Again, it's never been more important today than it has been in a long, long time. Uh, focus on the tweeners and the young boomers. Um, you know, they uh, are really kind of where the buying segment is right now. And just, you know, so your marketing efforts should be geared towards them. 
Um, you know, the 25 to 3,500 square feet, uh, you gotta make that really, really usable and incredible uh, and utilize all the space. Here's another one too that you guys are probably seeing a lot more of. Technology is expected today, uh, especially with you know the Wi-Fi and being able to do these Zoom meetings and all this smart home technology and everything else. That's not going away. So I think a good thing that you know sellers might want to consider is get the smart thermostats, make the home as smart as possible. They'll definitely recoup most of that money because that's what people are expecting as they're looking at properties. Uh, Multi-generational living we've already touched on is going to continue to grow, especially as the baby boomers continue to age uh, and the young boomers are going to be responsible for taking care of the, 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 their parents. I'm going to let you uh, take the last five there, Jenny. Sure. Health and wellness, uh, critical. I, I think that's um, obvious. Uh, sustainability and living off the grid. Um, lots of turkey jerky stockpiled in the basement. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but I think definitely um, sustainability is an important component of that for sure. Home office, fitness rooms, media rooms, virtual rooms, what we would call flex space, being able to be um, sort of divided a bit as needed for multiple use. And then, of course, brands. Uh, this has been ongoing for a bit, but brands that they trust will matter more uh, than virtual sales platforms. Uh, and that certainly rings true for us as a great trusted brand. And it's time to sharpen your tools, your product, and your strategy. Uh, I, I reiterate this um, because I think it's so important. What we have seen all of you do uh, in the last 60 days personally and professionally has just been superb. I mean, you've been flexible, you've been innovative, you've tried new things and um, it shows. And I think it's gonna elevate us even beyond what we were anticipating uh, coming out of this. So kudos to you all. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And uh, the what should I do right now, for those of you that were on last month, I didn't change this slide because I think that the same remains true. So uh, the first thing is acknowledge and accept things aren't going back to normal. Uh, we just got to figure out what that nor new normal is going to look like. Your communication continues to be critical. Um, we've given you, I hope, some tips and some ideas of maybe what your consumers want to be hearing and seeing and how you can communicate that to them. Knowledge is power market updates, you know, what's going on in the market, uh, those kinds of things, you know, because we've seen a lot change over the last 30 days. I think we're going to continue to see changes over the next 30 days, especially as we start to re-enter back in and start coming into the offices and people start coming out and buyers start coming out in more demand. Your sellers start reaching out to you and saying, okay, I think it's about time to put the house on the market. Your ability to kind of convey clearly and articulate the, what's going on is going to be hugely important. Um, keeping in mind everybody's circumstances are unique. Everybody's in different places, um, you know, and just so be sensitive to that. But hone your critical skills now. Um, are they currently aligned with the new market realities? Master your market vital signs, things such as what is the total days on market right now? What is the month supply? What is the average or the median sales price in those communities that I work? You should be able to just rattle those things off the tip of your tongue um, as you're out and about. And then lastly, uh, kind of touched on it before, you gotta still take care of you. Um, you know, we saw the, the slides or the surveys there earlier. Obviously everybody's in a different place, uh, um, you know, with what's going on. But if you don't take care of you first, you can't take care of others. So don't forget to take care of yourself and, um, you know, uh, be, be in a great place and a great mind to to help others. So uh, with that, we'll take any questions that you guys might have uh, regarding any of the information we went over. I've been monitoring things as they've been coming up um, and I haven't really seen uh, too much, but let me just go back here and see. Um, can we use some of these slides for our social media? Absolutely, would love for you to do that. The slides will be available. Um, we will get those out to everybody. Uh, are these feature stats different pre-COVID? Some of the things um, that we talked about were probably things that were going on before the pandemic, but certainly things like the importance of home, 
and the features and kind of the where people are leaning towards to some of these virtual rooms or the workout room, the, the extra office like Jenny mentioned um, are gonna be things that I think we continue to see. <laughs> Dave Wagner, you'll like this, Jenny. He says, I love the name Young Boomer. I thought I was just advanced middle age. So Dave, you're always a young boomer. You're actually a, 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 a young Gen X or Gen Y in my mind, my friend. Uh, let's see. Um, temporary. We are not. We are not considered temporary services, Tanya. In that slide, uh, we're more professional services. Uh, so when you're looking at those numbers, and let's see. I think that's all I see right now. Um, thank you, John. Appreciate the uh, compliments there, and. Uh, so yeah, uh, one thing is uh, you guys will all be receiving a survey uh, at the conclusion of this webinar. Uh, feel free if you'd like to participate in it. Uh, we'd love for you to do that. It gives us an idea of what we can uh, be doing to provide this kind of content to you moving forward. Um, and uh, Jenny, anything you'd like to close this out with before we go? I got a few more questions coming in, but if you'd like to say say something real quick. Sure, sure. Uh, first of all, thank you, Todd, for including me and for uh, uh, the great research that you continue to bring to our group. And uh, I just want to say to all of you, you're amazing and we need you and we appreciate you. So thanks for taking your time today uh, and we'll cover the last few questions, but uh, it's greatly appreciated. Awesome. Well, again, this was a lot more fun being able to at least see you because at least I felt like we were just having a conversation versus <laughs> just staring out into the to the universe. But uh, um, let's see. I had one other question about um, how do you project the migration to the suburbs will be? Um, I think we're I, I just saw an article uh, yesterday where uh, there might be more of a tendency for that. But we have been seeing such a a movement for people to want to get more in an urban like setting and trending and flocking more towards downtown Atlanta and areas around the Beltline. I think we'll probably continue to see that, especially since, um, you know, location or drive time is still a big, big consideration for people here in Atlanta. As long as those areas um, have access to the things that are important to people, um, I think that we're going to, you know, continue to. Uh, see, um, you know, people flocking towards the things where they have the amenities that they want to enjoy, like walkability, convenience to shopping and things of that nature. Jenny, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I, I think going back to the number one thing on the survey was location. And so my first question would be, in a location, what's important to you? And that will drive the answer. There's always going to be people that say, I want a huge yard or I want to live in the suburbs or I must live, you know, where I can easily access transit. So finding out what that location means to them is going to be the driver because I think there's a flavor for, for everybody here in Atlanta. And that's what makes living here so great. Yep. Couldn't have said it better. Um, had a question about when I send the slides out. Um, Will they be uh, individual? I'll send it out in a PowerPoint so you can pull out whatever slides you want um, and not have to, to use them all. And let's see. Uh, can we include Gwinnett County in the next webinar? I will do my best. You guys are just, it's a lot of research. I'm telling you, if anybody wants to come help me, I'll take the help. But yeah, we'll see if we can add uh, Gwinnett County, Holly, uh, in the next uh, go around here. That way we'll just have all the six core counties. Uh, with many listings having price reductions, have the reductions been significant, specifically sales price to original list price? Um, what I have been seeing, and that might be a great, if I can figure out a way to kind of get a sense of, well, I do, I, I give the average price reductions. Um, I've done that in the past. And I would say, typically speaking, the price reductions are running anywhere from about 5 to 10% of the original list price. But I will um, definitely take a look at that and uh, share what the average price reductions uh, have been. Uh, well, I, I, I'll tell you what, I'll do it for the next 30 days uh, that are coming up and kind of show you what they have been. 
but they typically track anywhere from five to 10%. So, uh, and, you know, and of course that's gonna vary by price point. You know, as you get in the upper end and the million plus, it's probably gonna be a little bit higher than that when they do have a price reduction. But I will uh, add that uh, as a statistic to share with you guys next month. Hey, one other thing on that before you leave that topic. Uh, yeah. Two great resources that are free and easy for you all to use. One is on our website, uh, on your pages, our market insights. And you can make that very specific for uh, school districts, neighborhood, zip code. So however granular you want that to be, there's some really great info and that can be automatically sent to your clients if you so choose, or you can get it and then articulate that on their behalf. The other is RPR and that is free and available to you through uh, as, a, as a realtor. And hopefully your broker has been or is about to be showing you uh, that resource because both are very simple to use and have very relevant and micro, um, uh, you know, area specific. Exactly. All right. Well, I don't see any other questions that have come up. Um, thank you again for uh, the compliments uh, to both uh, Jenny and myself on this. Um, again, if you will answer the uh, question, the survey at the end of the webinar, it will help us determine the kind of information you would like to see moving forward if you would like to continue having these kinds of webinars moving forward. So if you'll take the time to answer those, we would greatly appreciate it, Jenny. Thank you for your time. You're awesome as usual, our fearless leader. Um, can't thank you enough. And everybody, I hope you have a great rest of the day and a great weekend. We'll see you later. Take care.